You're listening to the Nerd to Know Media Network. Join us at nerdtoknowmedia.com. Welcome to another episode of Doing It For The Exposure, the show that loves a good hustle. I'm your host, Mannequin Blue, and today's special guest is the world-traveling dancer, pole artist, and burlesque performer, Daria De Colette. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, I'm very excited to be here. This is my first ever podcast interview, and I'm a huge podcast fan in general, so I'm psyched. Oh, well, we're really, really happy to have you. And you're actually the first person that has reached out to me that I've never met before, which is very exciting because we're growing. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Exciting. <laughs> so, Daria, why don't you tell us a bit about what you do? Okay. So I do quite a few different things, I suppose. I'm really a dancer. Like, that's where it all started. I started doing ballet from a really young age. Like, I guess my mom was like, we need to get her out of the house for an hour. Let's throw her into this and see what happens. She definitely did not expect me to still be doing it 20 plus years later. But anyway, so I did like danced and did, you know, ballet and jazz and then did drama and all that kind of stuff when I was a kid all the way up through school. And then I was doing the leave insert and you know, everyone's like, oh, I'm going to do law, I'm going to do veterinary, I'm going to do medicine. And I'm over here, like my little musical theatre showgirl heart beating out of my chest, being like, I just want to dance forever, you know. And my parents, God love them, were actually super supportive and were like, I mean, okay, if this is what you really want. So I did three years uh, full-time dance training after I finished the Leave Insert. So I went to the College of Dance in Dublin for two years. And then I went to Broadway Dance Centre in New York for another year-ish. And after that then, I was just kind of like traveling and performing and auditioning and hustling my ass off. And I started doing pole somewhere along the way. And then this is a, a massive nutshell, but like, once I decided to move back to Ireland, I made the transition into burlesque. And that's the kind of long story short version, I suppose. I suppose you could say that you're classically trained. Yeah, I would say I probably am classically trained. I still technically say that I train in ballet, although, you know, it's been a while since I've moved back to Ireland and I haven't had as much training as I normally would. But yeah, I did ballet for like 20 years, you know, not to super high standard, but I had like Russian ballet teachers at one point, you know, so it was pretty, pretty hardcore for a while. Yeah, they don't play around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can imagine. <laughs> and you say you're not high standard. <laughs> Oh, you know, you know us Irish, right? We're always like, ah, you know, I'm doing a bit of dancing. That's grand. It's grand. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm no expert or anything. I just yeah. dabble. <laughs> dabble, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've only been doing it for 20 plus years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you started doing the ballet. How did the pole and the burlesque come into that then? So I guess I always just had seen, you know, when pole started getting more like mainstream, I which was just see people doing these like crazy amazing tricks and that was at a time when I didn't understand that like when you're on a spin pole like the pole itself actually spins and it's not like the dancer actually revolving that much on the pole but like I thought it was like some kind of circuit de soleil magic you know I was like this is like how is this even possible so I was just always curious and it's so you know sexy and gorgeous and I think when I became aware of Arlene Caffrey, who's obviously like our Irish pole queen, and started following her. And then I just really, really wanted to, to try it because it seems like a really good combination of things that I loved, which is dance and then like weight training. And I was in New York at the time and there was an amazing studio in Manhattan called Body and Pole. So I took my very first ever classes there and I'll never forget it because like you're holding the pole inside your armpit with two hands, you're squeezing everything you've got and she, all she wants you to do is just lift your two feet off the floor at the same time. Like not one, two, two feet together. And I couldn't do it. I was so sweaty. I had no grip whatsoever. 
and no strength either and she came over and she stood in front of me and she was like two feet two feet at the same time I was like I can't do it yeah so that was the first the very first class but yeah I just fell in love with it like it's it's a tale as old as time at this point but the bruises and the pain and the burns they don't put you off they just kind of like spurn you on because you're like I want to get through this pain so I can learn how to do that super cool move yeah I think that's the difference between you and I as well because like I very very briefly back when I was trying to be super fit got into pole fitness and you know I went to the I think I went to like three classes or something and it took three classes for the instructor to actually come over and look at me and be like oh yeah you have no grip strength whatsoever like in front of everyone and I was like oh the public shame (laughs) whereas for you you would have been like well that's not gonna stop me I'm gonna keep trying I was like I give up (laughs) yeah I was very determined I was like okay this is a challenge you know I can do this my arms aren't so strong but my legs are like we'll get there so yeah. yeah and pole is kind of it's a whole body thing oh my god you're so right like The thing about it is that when you're training and you're just, you're trying so hard to like nail this move and you're just trying to get, you know, your arm there and your leg there, you don't even notice how hard you're working. Like you don't notice all the muscles that you're engaging until you wake up the following morning and your core is on fire and your ass is in bits and you're like, oh my God, what happened? Uh, Why do I hate myself so? (laughs) (laughs) So then where did the burlesque come into it? Okay, so with burlesque, I think the very first instinct I really had that it was something I wanted to learn more about was when I was, I lived in London for about five years and one of the places I lived, one of my apartments, my housemate was a full-time burlesque performer in London. Her name's Felicity Furor. She is definitely one of London's like top performers. I lived with her so she was out like six nights a week gigging all over the UK and I used to watch her like make her own costumes on the floor of our living room. Like our, our gaff was unreal. It was just feathers, rhinestones, glitter everywhere all the time. Like, and I was like, how is she doing this? Like this is, she's making, she's creating characters out of nothing, you know? And then I went to see her perform and I was like, oh my God, I gotta get me in this. I need this. But obviously like becoming a burlesque performer takes a lot of like time and financial investment, which I did not have when I was a poor, hungry, hustling dancer in London. So it wasn't until I came home to Galway, which was about a year ago, like last May, that I was like, okay, you have the time. I got a full-time muggle job as well. So I was like, okay, I have like disposable income for the first time ever. And I think now is a good time to just take the plunge. But I'd also, so I have a really good relationship with Tommy from the Dirty Circus. He took a chance on me when I first came home from New York and I didn't know, I didn't even know what burlesque and cabaret was, but he was like, oh, you're a dancer in Galway who I've never met before. Like, just come and do the show. Had never seen me perform and was like, just come and do whatever you want. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So when I came back from London then last year, he was like literally the exact same, like, oh, come and do two two bits at the Roisin Dove and I was like this is it okay here's my chance and I put together two acts so quickly in the space of about three weeks heavy on the Amazon Prime orders like wow and yeah and then out of that like two two of my acts were born and they have been massively upgraded in terms of costume quality ever since but that was kind of how it started and once I had two I was like I need more and I started improving things and building on things and all that jazz and now I'm a finalist for Miss Burlesque Ireland 2020 or whenever we actually get to do it which was a surprise but a nice one so (laughs) I actually noticed that we've had a couple of burlesque performers on the show before and they usually say something similar is that it was something they wanted to do for ages and they were like I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it and they put it off on the long finger. And then when they actually did it, it was like baptism of fire. It was, it's, you know, similar story. You have to put something together in a week or whatever it is. Is that kind of the standard? I don't think so, really. Like, it's funny you say that because I remember listening to your episode with Memphis Shell, who's a really good friend of mine. And she had a story just like that. You know, it was also kind of last minute and thrust upon her. But I think, generally speaking, no, because I think in the short time that I've been in like doing burlesque in Ireland stuff tends to get booked up quite early this is in normal times obviously but like my calendar for 2020 at the end of February was already like I had bookings up until November 
So things were, I feel like things get booked, generally they do get booked quite far ahead. But yeah, it just happened to be like that one time. But Tommy is actually notorious for like changing his mind on me last minute or getting me in on something like super last minute because he knows I'll never say no to him. So. <laughs> I think Memphis said that as well. She said something about Tommy's the dirty circus, right? Yes, yeah. yeah, I think she said similar where he can call her last minute and say, I'll oh, just throw something together. It's fine, whatever. And yeah. she just does it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he just, he trusts us like really well to like just pull it out of the bag. God love him. So the last show I did before the lockdown with him, which was February, like texted me the day of and was like, here, listen, I know you were going to do these two acts, but can you do these two instead? And I was like, you know what? Only do it because it's you. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Screw rehearsals. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's brilliant. I think it's it's Gemma and Tommy do the Dirty Circus, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think I kind of know Gemma in passing, but I don't think I ever actually met her. But it's mm. it's just fun hearing that you know this dynamic from a, a group that organizes shows and stuff, and it always works. It, it always comes together. It's brilliant, yeah. and the the fact that they trust their performers. And like you said, they take a chance on people they don't really know. Like, we definitely need more of that in the industry. A hundred percent. Yeah, big time. Yeah. So you've traveled around the world quite a bit as well. I've been a few places, yeah. <laughs> one or two. <laughs> one or two. Not as much as I'd like. I mean, this year was supposed to be full of it, like 10 times more. But, you know, we won't, we won't go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I got pretty, pretty lucky. Like New York was definitely the highlight. Like, I mean, I wasn't even professional at that point. I'm still in, I'm still training, but I did, I had some gigs there that were amazing, but just being like in the greatest city in the world, essentially, and such a happier time in the world, you know, it was like a pure dream come true. And it's like, when I was doing the Leaving Cert and you know, I was kind of prepping for dreaming for all of this. Like I was, I was watching Glee so much, you know, cause it was that time. <laughs> And like the season where like Rachel moves to New York and all that, I was like, oh my God, that's what it's going to be like for me. You know, <laughs> that's what I want. And yeah, so like definitely like training in New York was the absolute dream. And it's still, still my favorite city in the world. I was on Good Morning America a couple of times. They frequently hire dancers for when they have like artists on performing and like Good Morning America Studios is right in the middle of Times Square. There's always tons of fans who come outside the studios to like, you know, see who's there and meet people. So I danced for Iconopop and they had that, I don't care. Yeah, I yeah. Care. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I danced behind them and uh, Postmodern Jukebox, which I'm sure like every burlesque performer in the world knows and probably has danced to before. Oh, and then a big one was we did the summer concert series, which is what like Good Morning America will do, like live concerts in Central Park. So we did The Wanted, who were that British boy band that were big around the same time as One Direction, and there was like a whole rivalry with that. <laughs> Very like NSYNC Backstreet Boys energy, you know? So yeah, dance for them as well, which was crazy cool. Yeah, so like those are some like definite highlights for New York. London came afterwards. London, London was London. I was, you know, if anyone lives in London, they know it's like a hard place to live, but a lovely place to visit. So I love going back now when I can afford to. <laughs> when there's no stress or pressure. <laughs> yeah, and you don't have, you know, like a crazy commute to your day job in the mornings and all that kind of, you know, big city vibes but yeah I went to India that was probably the other like crazy story this job was this was such a random job actually like I think I had applied for something totally different and like the agency I was applying through came back to me and they were like oh they don't want you for this job but we have another opening in India if and they're interested in you and I was like I was saying no to nothing I was like yeah I need a job <laughs> like, give me all the work so that ended up being for, this is like, honestly, so, so random. So you know how like cricket is huge in India and Pakistan and those countries. Mm -hmm. So they have a huge, big league every year called the IPL, the Indian Premier League. And for some reason, they always have cheerleaders for their teams at the IPL. So I was a cheerleader for the Delhi Daredevils. <laughs> for two months in India and we traveled all around the country with our team and 
I learned so much about cricket, my God. <laughs> it's information that is wasted on me because who can I talk to about cricket in this country? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that is wild. <laughs> So random and it was one of the best gigs I ever had honestly because like the girls I was working with were we got on so well we were like a family and we saw like some we saw so much the, well we saw a lot of airports mostly <laughs> like we flew so much a lot of airports and a lot of hotels but when we had the spare time as well like you know we did a lot of sightseeing and we did the Taj and we did all the, the usual bits you know but that was insane that whole trip <laughs> And you know what? Sometimes it's the random gigs, the one that you're like, why am I saying yes to this? Those are the ones that end up being the best. Like I had last year, a friend of mine who's a, a balloon artist in Scotland, he called me randomly and he was like, do you want to come to Bahrain? Wow, <laughs> I was just like, what are we doing in Bahrain? And he was like, oh, we're just making balloons. <laughs> and I was like, me sitting there on the phone and being like, how do I say no to this? <laughs> you know, so I was like, yeah, I'll totally go to Bahrain. And, you know, unfortunately that ended up not going ahead because it was, you know, right as lockdown was happening that we were supposed to be flying out. I think it was like the week before lockdown hit or something, we got a call and we're like, mm, yeah, we can't really have you over. But it was just like the randomest thing because they were, they do this like Formula One festival every year. So they were just going to fly us out to make balloons. It was so random. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I I can guarantee it probably would have been so cool if we had actually oh, gone but they could have been class like yeah sometimes stuff is just so like out of the box and you're like I just have to go with this and see what happens I just want to know like yeah <laughs> this is the thing that we do as artists is we hustle so much that no matter what the job is we just take it and we take as many as we can and we we're like well, I'll fit them in I'll fit them all together yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it'll work out nothing pains me more than having to say no to something because I already have something booked like, yeah <laughs> or the thing that's been killing me lately has been saying no to gigs because we're still in lockdown and people yeah. are calling you to do parties and stuff and you're like I can't <laughs> that yeah I'm sure, like you you're obviously getting more of that than than I am for sure but that would hurt my soul so much as well massively <laughs> <laughs> so soul destroying oh god what a time to be alive. <laughs> yeah. I, and as well as that, like this year was the year that like anybody that I've talked to has said, oh, this was going to be my year. I was going to travel. I was booked to go here and there. You know, I was booked out till Christmas. Yeah. It was good. This was going to be the year. And now we're all kind of sitting here going, hmm, what do I do next? <laughs> I mean, like the only thing that I know how to do is just look forward to 21 and like keep hoping, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if, if you would be in the same boat, but you know, some people are sitting there going, right, I have to think of acts and I have to make the costumes now and I have to prepare. Literally, that was me. I was like, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. <laughs> <laughs> I ordered so many costume pieces during like full on lockdown. There was packages coming. Like there was, I was getting like three a day, bulk packs of rhinestones, feathers, whole bits that were coming the entire time I never not had a glue gun near me do you know what I mean for like four <laughs> weeks like. and next year when we're finally out of lockdown you are gonna have the best costumes everyone's just gonna come out in like extra sparkles extra glitter just extra everything and yeah I can't wait for that day <laughs> oh well, yeah we'll definitely have to keep following you to, to keep up to date <laughs> with that <laughs> And speaking of which, where is the best place for people to follow you to keep up to date? That is definitely Instagram for me. So it's Daria De Colette. It's a bit of a mixed bag. It will be a lot of poll, a lot of like throwback, you know, show photos. And then the odd like selfie with me and my gals or me and my friends. Because I don't have like an exclusive Instagram just for like burlesque stuff. I'm already spending way too much time on Instagram to be dealing with like too many extra accounts. You know what I mean? So, but yeah, Instagram is where I hang out for sure. Yeah, no, and I would definitely say like keep it all together. I know some people say that you should keep your work life separate from your personal life, but like I, I do the same. My dedicated Instagram is, you know, it's half personal stuff. It's half mm -hmm. stuff that I work on because like I'm running my Instagram. I'm running the show's Instagram and then occasionally I run the actual network's Instagram as well so it's like no that's too many <laughs> <Come on>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's only so much a person can do <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
and I work like my muggle job involves being on a screen on a laptop all day long anyway so and I that's that's already too much and then I know I'm spending you know way too much time just in general on Instagram as well so what is enough you know what's what's too much time on Instagram though <laughs> that's exactly what they don't want us to think yeah <laughs> Because I mean, a lot of people when they when the lockdown hit, everyone kind of well, I, I I suppose it's very assuming to say everyone, but a lot of people actually got kind of very down and they stopped going on Instagram and they stopped updating. There was no point. There's no point, and it's kind of people are starting up again now. So you're seeing a wave of people who are like, look at all the cool things I'm doing. Yeah, I'm actually loving seeing everybody going on their like their staycations and stuff. It's like I booked a week to go away to Kerry with my boyfriend in October and like I actually just can't wait because I'm, I'm so jealous of everyone's gorgeous like Ireland tour pictures I'm like oh my god I want to go yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah we ended up going to Carlingford for a couple of days just because my partner's folks live up that way and we literally just like it was great sat around the house in our pajamas and like I brought my switch and it was like the best staycation amazing yes I can't wait <laughs> I'm so looking forward to it but I kind of went a little bit the opposite way I mean when lockdown hit I so funnily enough my parents were away in Spain when we went into full-on lockdown mm -hmm. so I was I was living at home at the time and I was massively stressed and freaked out because they were away and they didn't seem to understand how serious the situation was and I was like you need to get home now so I was very kind of you know anxious about all that obviously and I was kind of rummaging around in my attic for some reason and I found my old teenage diary and I sat down and I started going through it and it was just the most hilarious cringe worthy stuff and I was like I just got to put this up on my Insta story real quick. So I like, I read out like an excerpt from like my diary when I was like 14 on my Insta story. And like, I got so much response from it. Everybody was just like, this is hilarious. Please, we need more. I was just like this. This is so relatable. I remember feeling this way. And so I did it for like, I think I did it for about 10 days straight. And it was a really nice distraction for me because I was so stressed about my parents being away. And it was just hilarious like and it made me cringe so much I couldn't even read half of it out myself because like you know it's just so embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's yeah it was it was so funny and so many people were just like loving it you know and I was like cracking open a bottle of wine I was like cool here we are for part seven you know? <laughs> oh my god that sounds amazing <laughs> Oh, it was, it was, I had some like old friends as well. Cause I changed, you know, if I was saying anyone's names, like I had to change everyone's names, you know, it's like, oh, this boy, I really fancied so many of my old friends being like, oh my God, are you talking about this person? Are you talking about that person? Who was that? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually brilliant. That, and that could be a new art form, you know, spoken word, <laughs> you know, dramatic <laughs> readings of diary entries. <laughs> you might've cornered the market on that one. Okay, I gotta start. I gotta capitalize on this. Okay, we're, we're making a new separate Instagram account just for this. I've decided. <laughs> <laughs> Dramatic diary, or I don't know. <laughs> oh no, that's hilarious. <laughs> I had a a few years back when I moved back in with with my dad. It was the same thing. I was going through all my old stuff, and I found my old diary, and I was like, oh god, oh god, no, oh god. But you know, I didn't have the kind of the. I suppose the bravery and the the disconnect from it that you had that you could actually get up and read it I was like burn it get rid of it <laughs> yeah and I was like let's put it on the internet forever <laughs> yay <laughs> oh are those still up can I check those out yeah they is, I made a story highlight because like I, yeah, I had people who were like oh I want to go back and work or I think it was like my sister wanted to like rewatch and or show her friends or something and I was like yeah, go on. It's there on a highlight. Just go mad. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. Oh, I, like, how, how do people think of these things? It's fantastic. I was just so, like, stressed and lonely in my house. And I was like, I want to talk to people. Let's just, okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm in the wrong business. I need to get out of the podcast and business and start finding some old diaries. <laughs> That is absolutely fantastic, though. Just to, to bring it back to art a bit, actually, there's something that I would like to ask you is, because, like you said, you're fairly new to burlesque and, and you know, you've been doing ballet for years and stuff like that. But what would you say to anyone interested in kind of following down your path? Good question. I think I came at it from a different angle. So, like, 
obviously I have had a lot of like prior stage experience and stuff like that and all that, you know, schmancy training or whatever. I do not think that's necessary or it's not like a requirement. If anyone is listening to this and they're like, oh my God, like this bitch trained in New York and all this kinds of carry on, like you, that's not, I probably personally probably wouldn't have had the confidence to get into burlesque without, you know, the background that I had anyway but it's not, it's a hundred percent not necessary. Like so many of the performers that I know and admire, like came into burlesque a totally different route through their, their completely their own paths and their own avenues. So I guess the main thing I would, I would advise would be go to shows because a lot of people have a preconceived notion of what burlesque is or what it should be. And especially now, like, because I was like that. I was like, oh, it's like, it's Marilyn Monroe. It's all classic and, you know, old school vintage vibes. And like, when I was like, okay, this is it. I'm going all in. Like, it just blew my mind how diverse and how basically it's an art form where anything is possible. So definitely going to shows will like show you that. It will show you, you know, what's possible, how people can take a, a subject or a character and completely make it their own. And then another thing would be to go to like actual burlesque classes as well, because so much of it again, and it's not about like, you know, any acting experience or dance experience you have or anything like that, but it's all about your attitude and your character and committing to that and feeling that you are that person or that character in your body in that moment and how you can get that across to an audience. For me, that's what it's really about. Because when I see like, I'm trying to think of some good examples on this. I know we talked about it earlier, but Memphis Shell is honestly the first one who springs to mind when I think about like powerhouse performers who are just like, she commands a stage with just her eyebrow. Like, <laughs> I don't know how she does it. But like, if she's listening to this, like she'll know, she'll know what I mean. Cause she just does this thing with her eyebrow. And it's like, like the whole audience will just go wild cause she arches her eyebrow and looks at you in a certain way. And you're like, oh my God, I like, I want it. I'll do whatever she tells me, like take all my money. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's the thing that like makes burlesque really exciting is that, yeah, you know, you could be doing like tricks and flips and twerks and all kinds of mad stuff. But like, if you can hold an audience in the palm of your hand and the slightest little shoulder, shoulder, eyebrow, eyebrow, like if that makes an audience go wild, like, you know, you've got it nailed. Yeah. And that, that I think the way Memphis put it was that she just kind of stares people down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I've, I have like I have seen her perform and it is very like it's intimidating but in the best way it's kind of like oh my goodness <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. She, she looks like she's gonna beat me up but I kind of want her to yes. <laughs> yes such a good way to describe it oh but it's it's great seeing the different you know different performers having different styles because you have like like you said, like you have people who are, you know, let's say Bonnie Boo, she does a lot of yeah. twerking. She's very high energy. She is like crazy good dancer. And then you've got like Bella Curve, who's, you know, classically trained ballerina. So she's kind of more deliberate in her movements. And then, you know, you get people like even Gala Gray, who has this very ethereal, soft kind of quality about her. And it's just amazing how they're all bringing something so different to the art mm -hmm. form, but it all works. Yeah, it's honestly what I love about it the most because when I was like a like a dancer, every audition I went to, it was always about like, do you fit the brief? Do you fit the casting director's ideal? Do you look like the other people in the cast already? Are you going to fit the costumes that we already have? Guess what? I never did. So that was always something that like I was hyper aware of back in the day is that I'd be in like auditions and I would know that I was nailing the choreography and you'd still get caught and then you look around and you see that oh I got caught because I don't look like all these other dancers you know so I love that burlesque is an art form that like you create the piece like you get to decide what music to dance to decide what costume you want to wear that suits your body and makes you feel good you do the movements that you feel good doing and it's literally all about that one performer. And I like, I basically never want to want to go back to like trying to fit into someone else's casting ideal ever again, because now that I know how incredible it feels to have like total artistic control and do whatever it is that makes me feel and look good, why on earth would I ever want to do what somebody else wants me to do ever again, you know? Yeah, no, I think you're completely right there. And it, it goes into, it's not just burlesque. It's like any, like you said, 
it's any art form, it, it's dancing, it's acting, it's whatever, you know, if they're mm. looking for somebody specific and you're not exactly what they're looking for, it kind of knocks your confidence a bit and you feel like you're not good enough. And mm. people, sometimes they don't stop and think, okay, well, this is subjective. This is what they yeah. want. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. It's just, maybe I don't fit this thing, but that doesn't diminish my value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's really hard to remember that as a dancer just because when we were in college like you do get told obviously you're prepared like you're going to hear the word no like a million times more than you're going to hear the word yes and so you are prepared for that but it is like over time you could, there's only so long it can go on for being water off a duck's back like there does get to a point where it starts to sort of like slowly chip away at you and you're like this is you know i'm not getting booked because of something i actually can't change like i cannot change the size of like my thighs and my ass like i can't it's my skeleton you know what i mean so when you're kind of like battling against something as like permanent as the way your bones are structured you're kind of like okay something's wrong and it's not me <laughs> yeah and that was always something i love from i don't know if you watch drag race but jinx monsoon Mm -hmm. she's probably hands down one of my favorite queens and it was purely just be for her attitude the whole time she's in the show you know because people are critiquing her and telling her she's not good enough and she's just like oh water off a duck's back it's fine it's fine and she ended up winning yeah yeah I loved Jinx that, that season actually I remember that yeah so it's just because you might not fit the mold that doesn't necessarily mean you have no value yeah yeah it's dead on that's dead on and like yeah as I said like I'll just say it again like that's one of the things I love about burlesque is everyone takes it makes it their own puts their stamp on it and that's what people want to see that's what people book you for and I'm just I'm over trying to fit into like a cookie cutter mold you know yeah no you just do you and people will love you for it and they will come to all your shows <laughs> <laughs> And if, you're, and if you're listening to the podcast when the burlesque shows start back up go to all of them and go see as many people as you can because we need to support them they are small business owners and they hustle big time yes there is a show the first show i'm going to this friday in dublin undercurrent cabaret are having a show and as soon as i saw it i was like two tickets booked done because any show that's happening that I can support, I'm like, I'm there. We got to get this back on the road as soon as it's safe and as soon as it's possible, you know? Oh yeah, completely. And I, you know what? I love Undercurrent. It's kind of one of the shows that I hate missing, but mm. I'm still like at the minute, I'm still in kind of self cocooning lockdown just because I'm living with someone who is, would be high risk. Sure. But we've been like plugging that show, even on the podcast, social media, been like, everybody go to this. Because yeah. they're great. I love Undercurrent. They're fantastic. I, I need to get them. We need to have them on the show. Oh my God, you should. This is actually going to be my first time seeing them. Like I've seen most of them individually, but seeing like a full Undercurrent show, this will be my first time. So I'm sorry. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. And you know, it's one of my favorite things to do because every year they always do a show on my birthday. <laughs> so I'm like, I am going for my birthday every year. <laughs> oh. And they probably hate me because I'm one of these people that like gets, you know, slightly sauced or whatever, and then maybe heckle one or two, but it's always supportive heckling, you know, yeah. but you know, <laughs> they, I, I could totally understand if they don't like that. And I'm very, if you're listening, I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I love them. They're fantastic. You are in for a great time. And I think actually, yeah, definitely anyone listening, if there are still tickets left by then, check it out because it's going to be on <laughs> So just before we go, is there anything else that you would like to talk about that you haven't touched on yet? There's just one thing I kind of want, I should have brought this up earlier really, but when we were talking about pull, there's a lot of like stuff in the community and in, you know, and I think this is kind of across the board between like pole and burlesque, but like I never shy away from the fact that our art forms came from sex workers and that conversation is very much happening at the moment. and we wouldn't have like the incredible like the shoes obviously are the first thing that comes to mind but like we wouldn't have the aesthetic we wouldn't have we wouldn't have the moves we wouldn't have like the pole itself wouldn't exist as we know it now if it hadn't been for strippers and sex workers back in the day and personally myself because I'm a performer I like to acknowledge that and make sure people are aware that like this is part of the history no more than burlesque like burlesque obviously originated in like gentlemen's clubs and stuff back in the day and what I like to think that what I do now is like an homage to like those sex workers and strippers of their time. But I think it's important for me 
to acknowledge that and for people who do poll for example like as a hobby like I don't expect people to be like I just need to let everybody know that like I'm pro sex worker like even though they should be but it's I think it's important for people to like know and acknowledge themselves like just at the back of your mind like oh I love this I love doing poll this is awesome and new and, and you know I'm, I'm really enjoying this or whatever oh I guess there's like, Oscar said I've came from like strippers and strip clubs and stuff like that. Well, I guess, you know, I should maybe like not be so like anti-stripper and anti-sex worker because they created this hobby that I love, you know? So yeah, I just, that's a conversation that's been, that's been going around at the moment because FKA Twigs was obviously called out for using stripper and sex worker aesthetics in her videos and stuff like that and then she felt compelled to actually say that she was a stripper in the past and has then gone on to like shine a light on loads of incredible organizations in the UK and she also advocated for the sex workers advocates of Ireland or sex worker association of Ireland one of those and then a whole bunch of other amazing organizations in the UK as well, like the East London Strippers Collective are a big one. And yeah, she just basically like really shone a light on the hardships of sex workers and strippers and what they're going through, particularly at the moment with COVID-19. So if you want to learn more about that, you can check out FKA Twigs' Instagram. I do not know her, but you know, <laughs> you should follow her and the organizations that she's supporting at the moment because it's important to know who created the thing that you love, I think, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up because mm -hmm. on the show, like we, we do talk about a lot of heavy stuff and human rights mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But I do, for anyone who is unsure, I do want to make it very clear that this show is also sex worker positive. We like to think that we're all inclusive as much as it's possible to be. And like there are a lot of burlesque performers, pole performers, dancers who are also sex workers. Maybe they're strippers. Maybe they do other things. You know, that's their business. But like regardless of why they do what they do it is still an art form like if they're if they're on the pole it's still an art form if they're dancing it's an art form so regardless of the how where or why we still very much want to support them and help them and they're struggling just as much as everyone else is and it's just as valid amen to that yeah <laughs> yeah so we we want to support everyone and actually i just want to I suppose while we're here, we'll just shout out to Missy Fortune. She is a performer who is also very strongly advocating for sex workers at the moment. So we're going to do a shout out to her because it's so important. Missy is amazing. If you've never seen, have you seen Missy perform live before? I have. And it's, it's a sight. Like it's, she's a firecracker. She, she did this performance. I saw her in Cork, actually. We were doing an event together. I was there doing balloons. She was performing, obviously. And she did this performance where she was like Darth Vader but it was oh my god I've heard about this I've never seen it live but I've heard of it it's unreal like the size the platforms on those boots and she's just like bending and rolling it's insane honestly like if you if anyone listening is not familiar with Missy Fortune check her out she's just wow <laughs> the firecracker like I competed with her at Miss Hell on Heels last year and she was the only one to do a hoop nearly everybody else did like Paul and burlesque bits but like I'm pretty sure she like cracked open a can of beer or something at one point and like poured it all over herself and like she had this like banging cowboy outfit on and like chaps and it was just oh she's an absolute beaut definitely like check her out follow her we love Missy yeah we love anyone who is doing their best to make the most of it <laughs> yes put that on a t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> maybe we will <laughs> but Daria, honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show and thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us. You're very welcome. I had such a good time. It was so nice just to have the chats and, you know, hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're all in this together, I like to think. <laughs> so for anyone listening at home, if you enjoyed this episode of Doing It For The Exposure and would like to hear more in the future, make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at D-I-F-T-E Podcast. You can also check out our stream on nerdtoknowmedia.com. We stream weekly on Spotify, SoundCloud and YouTube. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for listening to a Nerd To Know Media production. 